So at this time, I'm going to call to order our regular session, September 24, 2019. And the first order of business we have on the agenda is the opening prayer and the pledges of allegiance to the flags of the United States and the state of Texas. Councilman Gutierrez will lead us. If you'll join me in standing, please. Between heaven and earth, between night and day, between faith and sin, lie our hearts. We live in a small city with big hearts, and with our hearts we pray for our nation, our state, and our city. We pray for our friends, family, our community, and our first responders. Give us the strength today and guide us as we conduct matters of our community. Thank you for the abundant and gracious blessings. Thank you for life itself. And thank you for the measure of health we need to fulfill your calling. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. Next up this evening, we have a couple of proclamations. The first proclamation will uh, be recognizing Fire Prevention Week, which is October 6 to 12, and then we'll follow that with a proclamation regarding Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So I'm going to come down to the uh, podium, and we'll do both of these. The first time I ever had to read a proclamation after I was first elected mayor, I was absolutely terrified that I was going to slaughter the thing. A um, little bit of practice, I've gotten a little better. Whoops. What I have not gotten better at, though, is uh, being able to see it. So the first proclamation we have this, week, this evening is the Fire Prevention Week, uh, October 6 to 12, 2019, and it reads this way. Whereas Fire Prevention Week commemorates the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, which killed more than 250 persons, left 100,000 homeless, and destroyed more than 17,400 buildings, and serves as the motivating force to bring the people of Church together to build a safer community. And whereas the city of Church is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and visiting our city, and whereas the majority of the United States fire deaths, four out of five, occur at a home each year, whereas home fires killed 2,630 people in the United States in 2017, according to the National Fire Protection Association, and fire departments in the United States responded to 357,000 home fires. And whereas residents who have planned and practiced a home fire escape plan are more prepared and will therefore be more likely to survive a fire, and whereas working smoke alarms cut the risk of dying in re reported home fires in half, and automatic fire sprinkler systems cut the risk of dying in a home, home fire by about 80%. And whereas the 2019 Fire Prevention Week theme, Not Every Hero Wears a Cape, Plan and Practice Your Escape, effectively serves to remind us that we need to take personal steps to increase our safety from fire. Therefore, I, Michael Carpenter, Mayor of the City of Shirts, do hereby proclaim October 6 through 12, 2019, as Fire Prevention Week throughout the city, and urge all the people of Shirts to protect their homes and families by heeding the important safety messages of Fire Prevention Week 2019, and to support the many public safety activities and efforts of Shirts Fire and Rescue. Since, since I do get to sit in the chair and have a little bit of privilege from time to time to speak, I won't tell you the same story that I've told you many times about what, what happened with my family and the, the incident that we had in our house. Um, but I will tell you that uh, just a few months ago, we had quite a storm. Um, and the, uh, there was a lightning strike very close to my house, uh, enough such that I lost some equipment. And um, my neighbor's fire alarm went off because of the, I assume because of the concussion uh, and the, the, the proximity of heat from the lightning strike. And I don't know if you remember, but it was an amazingly, amazingly uh, wet evening. The rain was coming down in just torrents. Um, and in minutes, before any of us even knew what was going on, 
uh, our fire department was there at my neighbor's house with these amazingly bright lights on the house trying to find out if there was an issue. Uh, and, and frankly, they knew before the neighbors knew, and they were there. And that's the kind of service that, uh, that the department provides all of our citizens. And I've seen it for the last 20 years plus that I've lived here in the city. And it's a remarkable thing. So with that, I'm going to turn the microphone over to either or both of you if there's anything you'd like to share. Chief, please. So in October, we got with the school district and we're doing a poster contest. So we'll present that at a council meeting in October. But thank you all very much. Fire protection, fire safety is a, a very important topic. Um, it, like in the proclamation, it said, you know, several houses. Make sure to check your smoke detectors and have a plan out. All right, maybe if you'll join me in a round of applause for the work that this team does. The next one is with regards to Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, and I will repeat myself as I've done in the past. I served on the grand jury in Guadalupe County several years ago. And uh, I will tell you that no community, no community is free from domestic violence. Um, whether directed at a spouse or directed at children, uh, it exists ubiquitously in every community in the country. And we're not exempt from that. And the work that's done by the people that respond when these things occur, and frankly, the work that's done in the aftermath is pretty remarkable. And I'm not sure it's work that I would have the courage to do. So I, uh, as I read this, I will, um, will ask that you consider and keep in your prayers those that do work in responding to when these things occur and in the aftermath to try to help heal. And it reads, Whereas the crime of domestic violence violates an individual's privacy and dignity, security and humanity due to systemic use of physical, emotional, sexual, psychological, and economic control and or abuse, including to children and the elderly, and whereas the problems of domestic violence are not confined to any group or groups of people, but cuts across all economic, racial, and social societal barriers, and are supported by societal indifferences. And whereas the impact of domestic violence is wide-ranging, directly affecting individuals and society as a whole, here in this community, in Guadalupe, here in this community, Guadalupe Valley Family Violence Shelter answered 802 crisis calls and had 2,402 shelter days from September 2018 to August 2019. And whereas women are not only, are not only targets, young children and the elderly also are victims, and sadly emotional scars are often permanent, and domestic violence costs the United States companies at least $3.5 billion in lost work time, increased health care cost, higher turnover, and lower productivity. And now, therefore, I, Michael Carpenter, Mayor of the City of Shirts, Texas, do hereby proclaim the month of October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month and call upon all citizens, community agencies, religious organizations, medical facilities, and businesses to increase their participation in our effort to prevent domestic violence, thereby strengthening the community in which we live. So I think there's some folks that are here to join us, and I would be happy if you'd like to have a moment at the microphone and make a few comments about what's being done on the positive side of what happens with these things. Please. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Nicole Douglas. I'm the Crime Victim Liaison for Shirts, Civilo, and Live Oak. Um, I wanted to thank you again for your continued support and recognizing our efforts and first responders as a law enforcement agency. We often have these calls in our community. Um, you are correct. They are not um, just in one community, community, but in all. So we try to do our best in offering services so that people have op options and that they are aware that there are people in our community outside of law enforcement like Ashton, who works with our Guadalupe Valley uh, Family Violence Shelter, that can offer some more resources to help them when they're ready to make some decisions that can help them when they're 
ready to make them. But um, we do have a couple of events coming up. Here in Shirts, we're going to have a candlelight vigil. Uh, it'll be on October 28th at 6.30 at our Pickwell Park. And um, I believe Ashton's going to give you some more information on an event that'll be this weekend. So uh, first off, I want to thank you all for your continue, continued support as well. Um, we really do appreciate it. Um, we do have a fundraiser event coming up uh, this Saturday, the 28th, and it is in Seguin, and it's at the Silver Center on Court Street. Um, this fundraiser is all the benefits obviously come back to the shelter. Uh, Shelly Miles with San Antonio Living will be the MC. There will be a performance by um, Gabe Galvin Band from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. And there's barbecue, there's dancing, there's a fashion show, there's a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of fun that if y'all wanna come out, the tickets are available online or at the door. Online, they're $25, at the door, they're 35. But um, again, thank y'all so much for the continuous support. All right, next up we have some employee recognitions and I'm going to turn things over first to the chief. Mayor, Council, Dr. Brown, good evening. Mike Hanson with the police department. I'm excited about this recognition tonight. Uh, Manny Casas just graduated from the FBI's National Academy. I'm going to explain a little bit about the academy first and, and his... Uh, ordeal there. <clears throat> the FBI National Academy began in 1935. It was created in response to a 1930s study by the Wickersham Commission that recommended a standardization in, uh, and professionalism in law enforcement. With strong support from the International Association of Chiefs of Police and under the authority of Congress and the Department of Justice, the FBI Police Training School was created. Currently, the FBI National Academy, or NA as it's referred to, is a 10-week course of instruction that's held at the FBI Academy in Quantico. Each session hosts approximately 220 officers from around the world. The, course offered, the courses offered are undergraduate and graduate level. Classes are offered in law, behavioral science, forensic science, terrorism, leadership, communication, health, and fitness. The course, including all instruction, room and board, and transportation, is provided at no cost to the city. Much of the training involves the sharing of ideas and techniques and experiences with one another. This creates lifelong partnerships that transcend state and even national borders. Health and fitness is a primary topic during the academy. Besides the regular fitness courses throughout each week, there is the fitness challenge. This is a 10-week progressive, progressively more difficult fitness program that concludes with a six-mile run through a hilly wooded area on the Marine Corps Officers Candidate School. The course is littered with obstacles that require the officer to climb ropes, scale walls and fences, crawl under barbed wire and cold muddy water, maneuver cargo nets and more. It's become, it has become to be called the Yellow Brick Road excuse me, due to the yellow bricks placed along the route to guide the way. Those that are successful will receive an actual yellow brick with the inscription Yellow Brick Road, FBINA, and their session number. You will find these bricks are prominently displayed in the office, offices of anyone that received one. It is a valuable and coveted souvenir of the experience. The NA is a difficult course to complete and even more difficult to be accepted. Typically only about 200 of the positions are available to US based officers. And those are, and there are some that are reserved for specific departments. 
Each FBI field office has a number of available spots. Our office only has four. Should be noted that the San Antonio field office covers 17 counties and will include applicants from municipal police, sheriff's departments, constables, state agencies that are assigned in the area, and military officers here as well. Must be of at least the rank of lieutenant and must be nominated by the agency head. There's a lengthy background investigation and qualification requirements and exam, and then there's the wait. Manny was on the waiting list for five years. Once chosen, arrangements have been made to be gone for 10 weeks. Families are disrupted, departments are now short of command level officer, and the stress of being away for two and a half months looms on the attendee as well. The information received is put to use once they return. Policies may be changed, procedures may be updated. It also brings back a new network of colleagues where new information can be shared and applied. The ne networking continues with regular NA association meetings held in our region. Annual trainings are conducted as well. It's truly an experience that will enhance their abilities and achievements for the remainder of the career. This is a very big deal in law enforcement circles. In almost every ad advertisement to fill a police chief's vacancy, you will find the list of requirements or preferences will include the FBI NA. Manny Casas was accepted to the National Academy and attended session 277. Began at the 1st of July and he returned to work yesterday. In the history of the department, there have only been four graduates. I achieved mine before coming here, but the other three were Shirts PD when they attended. Former Chief Stephen Starr, former Lieutenant John Carew, and now Manny. Manny, at this point, I would like to present you with your ribbon. It'll be worn on your uniform and a Chief's coin for exceptional service. That's very well done. Now, many, on, many of you on the dais know the hardships for the families during times of deployment. Whether it's 10 weeks or 10 months or more, the sacrifice at home is real. Manny would not have been able to attend without the approval and support of his family. Therefore, in appreciation for their sacrifice, I would like to award Patty and Alex Chiefs Coins as well. I just wanted to say a word of uh, congratulations, uh, Manny, to you also. Um, the staff is proud of you. All of us who um, work at the city are very proud of you, your accomplishment. We know that this is going to add immeasurably to your, um, your professional qualifications and, and to your career advancement. Uh, I, I particularly think, uh, you know, waiting five years is really an indication of your sincere desire to want to go, and uh, that hadn't, uh, couldn't have been an easy thing to do. Um, but at any rate, uh, we, we do appreciate uh, your performance, and uh, uh, we congratulate you again, and, and thank you for your great work. Absolutely. Lieutenant? Yeah, I do appreciate it. I was going to say uh, thank you uh, for uh, Chief Hansen for making it possible, and you reminded me how much of a void I left uh, when I, you know, here at the PD. But uh, I do appreciate the support from the city, the police department. You know, it was, um, it was an adventure. I'd like to say thank you as well um, on behalf of all the residents and the staff and the council and, and my family. You know, this is the kind of work, folks, that, that's done by our staff that brings exceptionalism back to the city of Schertz. Uh, this has been going on for a long time. It's in the best traditions of the department and of all the departments in this city. Uh, and again, on behalf of all of the residents and the staff and this council and my family, thank you and congratulations. It's very well done. Next up, I'm going to invite uh, our city manager, Dr. Brown, to the podium. Dr. Brown? 
Thank you. I'm Mark Brown. I'm the city manager. And uh, it's my, my uh, privilege and pleasure to be able to recognize uh, Kyle Kennetator for his outstanding service to the city. Unfortunately, Kyle's leaving us, and his last day is on October 4th, but we wanted to take this opportunity to uh, wish him well. He's going to the city of Midlothian, where he'll be the economic development director there. Um, it's a great opportunity for him and his family, and uh, a, a tremendous way to advance his career. So we really appreciate uh, what he has done here. He's been a tremendously valuable member of our team, done great work for the city. He's been with the city seven years, and that's on, in two separate sort of tours of duty. Uh, but nonetheless, he's, he's done an outstanding job. Just a couple of his accomplishments uh, include working with the Titan Industrial Park and Robert Robinson Weeks developer, and uh, that was in the accomplishment of about 1.5 million square feet of industrial space. So a tremendous accomplishment for our city. So a lot of the industrial space you see up on the north end of Schertz is a tribute to Kyle's hard work. In addition, he, um, he established our incentive policy, which is really critical for us uh, as, we, as we try to attract new businesses to Schertz, and he created the Small Business Grant. And um, also his focus on infrastructure, I think, has been a very important piece of what he has done here in the city with our economic development department. So Kyle, on behalf of the staff and, and the city, I want to thank you for your professionalism, your dedication, your commitment, your outstanding performance. In addition, personally, Kyle's been very uh, essential to me in uh, gaining an understanding of economic development, how it works in our city. Uh, he's been um, very faithful in educating me and being patient with me as we discuss the various projects and going over them uh, many times, and it's been, been very helpful. So Kyle, uh, we wish you the best. Congratulations again, and the microphone's all yours. Please. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to tell each of you uh, my appreciation for the opportunity to serve here at the City of Shirts. You know, I truly believe that over the last several years that the community has come together and, and been put into a, a better, stronger position because of the work that we, and focus there on, on we as council, Staff, you know, staff is inclusive of planning and zoning, engineering, public works, fire marshal. Um, I, I know I'm forgetting somebody, but economic development in the city of Shirts truly is a team effort. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm sad to leave as, as this has been a phenomenal community for me and my family. Um, truly, there's never a good time to leave, although, um, you know, this is a community that is positioned for immediate future growth and and you know I look forward to reading about the exciting things that happen thank you very much to each of you for your leadership and your support um, of economic development of the economic development board and you know ultimately that collective effort that we do to grow our community and and help bless the lives of our residents thank you thank you sir it's well done And while, while they're taking a photograph, I think that Dr. Brown and Kyle have both been a little bit shy and conservative with talking about the things that have been accomplished over the last seven years. One of the things that's very important for us to, to recognize and consider is the fact that we moved from a position where the, the majority of our property taxes came from our residents and a minority of our property taxes came from commercial investment. Uh, we're now close to 55% of our property taxes coming co from commercial investment and only 45% coming from our residents. That balance is elusive. Not many cities get there. And what that does for us is put, put us in a position where as economic conditions change, both macroeconomic and microeconomic conditions change, we're able to much better weather the storm. We will not have as much variation as other cities might have. Secondly, I will tell you that the San Antonio, San Antonio Economic Development Foundation doesn't talk too much about their competition in the area except for mentioning shirts. It happens not every time they meet, probably not even every second or third time that they get together, but we come up often. And how is it that a city of about 40,000 people and around 32, 33 square miles can even begin to compete 
with a, with, with, with a behemoth like San Antonio, it's because we have fantastic staff who apply themselves and work very hard on our behalf. So again, Kyle, thank you on behalf of all the residents and the staff and, and this council and my family for all the work you've done. It's been exceptional. We appreciate it very much. I would like to stop there because it's a lot of pleasantry, but we do have a bit of business to attend to this evening. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the next item on the agenda, city events and announcements and announcements of upcoming city events. Uh, Mrs. Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and bear with me because there is quite a list here as there is not another council meeting until October 22nd. So I have two pages to go through. Uh, the first is election notice. Um, we're going to be holding a joint general and special election on November 5th for the purpose of electing council members for place one, place two, and for mayor, and for a special election to fill the vacancy of uh, the unexpired term for council member place four. So Thursday, September 26th at 5 p.m. is the last day to file for the special election to fill the vacancy of the unexpired term of place four. Candidate packets are available online as well as in the city secretary's office. Monday, October 7th is the last day for submitting voter registration applications in time to vote at the upcoming November 5th 2019 election and then Monday October 21st through November 1st is early voting begins and information regarding early voting and election day voting centers for Kamau, Guadalupe and Bear County uh, will be available on the city's website and will also be in the October issue of the Shorts magazine. Uh, the adult, adult dodgeball league is on a hiatus until the new league begins um, in January. It's going to be it's going to be on Sundays now um, at the community center. So more information to follow on that. On Saturday, September 28th, there is going to be a Homes for Dogs project, uh, which is a pet adoption and donation event at the Shirts Animal Adoption Center from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Again, Tuesday, October 1st, the regular city council meeting and is canceled due to national night out. Uh, the state secretary's office should have gotten with you to uh, give your information about uh, meeting in the city manager's office area and then departing for the neighborhood block parties. The annual fall cleanup is October 5th through the 20th and there is a note here that the uh, weekend for the hazardous items tires drop off is uh, now the first weekend so it's October 5th and 6th but for more information you can call Republic Services or Shirts Public Works. On Friday, October 4th is Manufacturing Day, and you can contact EDC for more information on that. Saturday, October 5th, Love Where You Live, Clean Up, Fix Up in the North Cliff neighborhood. Sign in at 7.30 a.m. at Windy Swan Memorial Park. Working projects from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., and then there's going to be a neighborhood celebration picnic from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. You can call 210-651-5462 for more information. Again, on October 5th is Coffee with a Cop, and it's going to be at the Starbucks at 3009 at Elbell Road, and that's from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. After that, in the evening, will be the Duncan for Pumpkins, and that will be at the Shirts Aquatic Center from 5 to 7 p.m. You can call the YMCA at extension 1900 for more information. Tuesday, October 8th, the city council meeting is canceled due to the annual uh, Texas Municipal League Conference, which will be held in San Antonio this year. Saturday, October 12th, uh, EMS will be holding some training. So there will be CPR, AED training, first aid training. And if you are interested um, in getting more information and to register for the classes, you can call 619-1430. Um, also that day on October 12th is going to be the local author, author fair at the Shirts Public Library, and that's from 1 to 3 p.m. Monday, October 14th, city offices are closed in observance of Columbus Day. Uh, Tuesday, October 15th is the monthly chamber luncheon at 11.30 at the Shirts Civic Center. And then finally, last one, we'll be back here on October 22nd for a regular city council meeting at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next up, uh, announcements and recognitions by the city manager, Dr. Brown. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. I do have a few tonight. Um, I think it's very important to recognize the outstanding performance of our city staff, and we've had a few events in the last uh, week or two uh, that warrant that. The first was we had a major uh, water main break on Shirts Parkway uh, Sunday night a week ago, and um, it caused a total outage in several of our subdivisions, and hundreds of residents uh, literally 
were almost without water immediately. Uh, we called out our water and streets crew, uh, and they just came out and I think did a fantastic job. They were able to isolate the valves to the to the water main, able to restore water um, in a minimum time, and and brought our folks back up to their normal operating condition. Uh, I just think it was an outstanding effort. I want to recognize them by name. Our water crew was Jared Mohite, Don Sarton, Moses Flores, Alan Diaz, Devin Saloka, Ish Pardo, Anthony Jimenez, Jordan Villarreal, Jeremy Ryle, and Stephen Armstrong. And our streets crew were Ron Sand and Everardo Guzman. Um, since then, they have uh, repaired the water main, and we still have uh, to do some work on the sidewalk there on Shirts Park Parkway, but a great job was done by them. Additionally, we had a deployment for uh, Tropical Storm Imelda, and that involved uh, many of our uh, public safety folks, uh, specifically in the fire department and in EMS. Our fire department deployers were Mac Mellencon and Chris Meek, and uh, they reported first to um, the task force headquarters at College Station. That's where they deployed to, and then they were sent to Beaumont after that. Um, that area received 30 to 40 inches of rain, and uh, this crew um, really was able to um, rescue 150 to 200 people along with an unknown amount of animals while they were deployed. And so they did an absolutely fabulous job, and they were, they were certainly uh, critical to that, um, that whole effort. Additionally, uh, we had one EMS person, uh, Chris Forster, who was in Texas Task Force One, uh, also in that same area, and his boat squad, he was on a boat squad, responsible for uh, 240 victim encounters, with 50 of them being classified as rescues. Um, our EMS folks also deployed the AMBUS. If you've never seen our AMBUS, it's, it's uh, quite impressive. It's uh, basically an ambulance that is a bus. And the ambulance strike team uh, that they were activated with, they evacuated one nursing home and 182 patient encounters. Uh, and so those six folks were Brandon Hill, the crew chief, David Rotano, our load master and driver, Tyler Boker on the crew, Jansen Williams was the crew member, Frankie Trifolo and Tyler McNeil were both crew members. So all of them did an absolutely fabulous job. They returned home this weekend, and um, and I think that's what it's all about. Our folks are ready, they're trained, they're experts, and they represented the city in an outstanding manner. And that's what I have tonight, Mayor. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Uh, how many of you were in a neighborhood where you were without water when the water main broke? I was one. There, there's a few of us in here. Um, I, I got to tell you, I uh, saw how much water came out uh, and the extent of the damage over time. And the fact that we had water back on it about two hours or thereabouts, I don't remember if it was two, two and a half, uh, is a testament to the abilities of our, sta our, of our staff and of the system that over time the city has put in place to recover from, I believe it's an 18-inch main, 16-inch main? 18. An 18-inch main break uh, and have water back on for all of us roughly in two and a half hours, two hours, is remarkable. It doesn't happen that way in every city. Uh, for us, we kind of feel like perhaps it was routine. Hey, the city did its job. Great, let's move on. Uh, but I, I want to say uh, not only to the team that came out and did the work, uh, but to all the people that have been involved over the last, well, now 61 years in building out a water system, including the procurement of it back in the day, uh, they've done a fantastic job, and we're all the beneficiaries of that. So that said, um, I'm going to move on to hearing of residents. We have three people that have signed up this evening. Uh, I would ask if you are able to keep your comments to around three minutes or so. Most importantly, if you would give your name and address so the city secretary can capture that for the uh, minutes. Uh, we have three people signed up. First up, uh, Gary Purvis. Even Gary, how are you? Good. Gary Perkle, 1032 Gate Creek Lane. Church, Texas. I just opened my water bill and then dropped it on the ground. And I looked at my electric bill, and for the first time in my life, my water bill was twice as much as my electric bill. And I bought the house about 18 months ago. I completely landscaped the backyard starting March of 2018. 
grass, plants, uh, little fish pond, all kinds of things. Watered it hard for four months. And my water consumption in last month was almost 10,000 gallons more than the four months that I landscaped my house. So a friend of mine said, Google smart water meter and high bills. And I did. And there is exhibit A, a ton of information, including Austin had a hard time um, reading the, the wireless meters, and they had to refund 70,000 customers because they were overbilled. Um, there's Atlanta, Georgia, Chicago, New York, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Laredo. Uh, it's all in here. All of them having problems with the new water meter. Uh, they tested a master meter, which is what y'all use. One meter was 97% accurate. The other meter was 225% above the, the water flow. And so I thought it would be better to download it, print it, and leave it for you guys to study. But I'm challenging the water bill because I've never used 69,300 gallons of water in one month at my house. I live by myself. I monitor my system. The water board came out. I have no leaks, no issue at all. The sprinkler system is the same as it was when I moved in. And I've used almost as much water in June and August as I did all of last year combined already since the new meter came in. And um, the other is Exhibit B, and I was totally unaware of that, but the RF and radio frequency of the water meters is a concern, and there's been a lot of write-up on uh, interference with cell phones, uh, Wi-Fi, uh, women having m medical issues that are pregnant, uh, rashes, and sicknesses from the ultraviolet microwave energy that the thing puts out. And um, I'm concerned about it, and I sure don't want to have a $400 water bill every month when last month it was $82. And so, Go ahead. so the only, the last thing I'd like to say is I'd like an opt-out policy, like the Texas Board of Utilities said that it's available uh, with the city permission, that if we pay a little extra money, uh, they change the bill, but we can opt out and get our old meter back if we want. And uh, the But for the water board, they've been over backwards. They've come out to the house. They've been very nice. They're excellent people, That the search water people. So I don't know, should I give them to yeah, you? Yeah, give those to me if you will, and I'll make sure that they're distributed. And I wrote down Thank you. Thank you very much. We will. Thank you, sir. Very good. All right, next up is Cindy Burris. Hi. I live at 1108 Dim Rock in Woodland Oaks. Thank you. And uh, I have the same complaint, and I think there's been over 100 responses on our local next door where we can... Um, have conversations with other residents um, of the same thing. I mean, I have neighbors next to me. That I live alone. So I have neighbors next to me that water all the time. They have two, three, four children, and their water bills are like 130. I've been here 36 years. Um, my water bill is typically 80 to $90. I'm very conservative where it comes to water. I have appliances that are supposed to be um, more conservative, and yet I got a bill for 64,000 gallons of water and $376. That is ridiculous. I'm sure you, I know the, the, the water people have been uh, inundated with phone calls. They've said to call our mayor. I figure since I'm coming tonight, I'm just gonna tell you. 
None of us can afford to pay these kind of bills. One guy got a bill for $4,800. Another woman on there says that she was pumping five to 700 gallons of water when she wasn't even home. She was on vacation somewhere. So something is wrong with these new meters. Garden Ridge had a big meeting and the news people were called. I mean, they found that there were problems with the meters. People cannot afford to live here in my wonderful city and y'all keep wanting more people to move in. Well, when it hits the social media, you won't have people coming to live here and you'll have people exiting here to go somewhere where they have fair water usage. I do not agree when they tell me that the meters are actually showing what you've used because I could not all by myself use 64,000 gallons of water, ever. Um, and uh, so my neighbors asked me to come and represent them because they're scared to death they're going to get something. I call the city, they say there is absolutely no leak um, showing. So they don't know why. So I just really, really ask you to consider your residents. If we're really priority one, then make this issue a priority. Find out what's wrong because we're not the only city that got new meters and we're not the only city having problems. Um, so please address it for us. Very good, thank you, ma'am. Before I call on the last person that signed up, um, we absolutely hear you and, and, and understand. I, I had a, a challenge with uh, my water when I got a new meter recently. Uh, turned out for me, however, mine was I did have a leak on my side. Uh, I had to get that fixed. But uh, please stay in contact with the water department. Uh, escalate as necessary if you have something like the example you just shared with us where it, you, know, it, it, you, know, you have a normal usage for a long period of time, you have a change in the, the meter itself, and you have what appears to be a, an impossible uh, level of usage, continue to bring that forward, uh, continue to escalate to the city manager as needed, uh, to me or to any of the council members. We are hearing you are looking into it already. Uh, all of us are well aware and all of us have neighbors um, who have had some level of, of change or, or, or difficulty that we, we, we experienced with them. So keep bringing that forward and help us uh, have visibility to what's going on. Absolutely. All right, and then uh, last to sign up is Jennifer Hackworth. Evening. Evening. I'm Jennifer Hackworth. I live at 5144 Knollwood. Thank you. I uh, wanted to just take a few minutes to voice my concern as a parent, um, as a citizen, about the implementation of 5G. Um, I'm just going to give you like a quick little history on it. And um, it's not here yet. It's coming in 2020. But I just want to get ahead of the curve and make sure that we're all aware of, of the dangers of 5G that are coming. Um, so FCC regulations were first set in 1996. And the average phone call um, using a cell phone was six minutes. The people who had access to phones were typically businessmen um, and doctors, um, kind of, you know, an upper class thing. In 1996, um, I was in high school and my mom had a huge box cell phone. It was like the big one. Um, so the studies that were done at that time were limited. Um, the regulations were based on the data that was available at that time. In 1996, cell phones were completely different than they are today. Um, today we operate, that was a 1G system, today we operate on a 4G system. So basically just what that means is the, the speed and the wavelengths are different. It used to be analog and now it's digital. Um, 5G is going to significantly increase the speed of our phones and, and the wavelengths. Um, so a faster speed means a shorter wavelength. That means we have to have um, exponentially more towers available. Um, so that means there's going to be towers like within feet of each other where today they're not that close to each other. So we're talking millions of towers and they're going to emit uh, radiation. So kind of tacking on to the smart meters. Um, we're just starting to evolve into this world where there's um, exponentially more radiation. So um, there have not been studies done uh, on the safety of 5G and there are very limited regulations right now. Um, the government has 
not updated any regulations in accordance with 5G, and a lot of private sector companies are the ones who are kind of doing the implementations and, and prepping for all this, and you've probably already seen commercials on TV about um, 5G from Sprint and Verizon. Um, so I, I, I'm just concerned as a citizen and as a mother that that is gonna expose us to um, something that's gonna be dangerous for us. There is actually a medical code for um, electromagnetic sensitivity. Um, so it's, some, it's like a real thing. <laughs> um, and so I just want to uh, just bring that up here and voice my concern. And if, if there's anything that you all can do, I just want it to be in your mind and on your radar, um, so to speak, um, so that um, when, it, when you do hear about it, when, when people are ready to implement those towers, that we have some already level of visibility and kind of know, you know, what the potential dangers are. That's it. All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, what I would say is anyone, anyone else that has a concern uh, about this, uh, I would encourage you to contact your, your state representatives, both in the House and the Senate. In the last couple of sessions, uh, the state legislature has severely limited uh, our ability as a city to regulate where antennas are placed. In fact, going to the level of saying that we cannot stop the carriers from placing antennas on our infrastructure, our light poles. We can't stop them any longer. We can't say yes or no. We can give them some parameters within which they have to work, but they get to put them there. And I, I just, I would implore you if you have a concern about that, or even about just the idea that the state has removed our ability to regulate largely uh, and placed the power in the hands of the providers. Uh, if that doesn't sit well with you, I encourage you to take that up with, with your legislators as well. Again, at the state level, that's where we've had the challenge in the last, the last two legislative sessions. All right, uh, that's everyone that signed up under hearing of residents. The next item that we have on the agenda are consent agenda items. Um, I have a question actually for the city secretary before I move to uh, the consent agenda items. Uh, items 15 and 16 could be handled on consent if we so move them into the consent agenda, could we not? They are rather ministerial in nature. They are, but I have some special guests, if you can give me the privilege of introducing them, because I asked them to be here this evening. Then I'll not bring them into the consent agenda, and I'll read the consent agenda as it is presented. Item number one, the minutes, approval of the minutes of the regular meetings of September 3rd and September 10, 2019. Item number two, calling a special meeting, November 18, 2019 to canvas the results of the November 5th, 2019 general and special election and call a runoff election if necessary. Item number three, resolution 19R126, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing memorandums of understanding with the Texas Department of Public Safety for the purpose of obtaining certification of commercial vehicle enforcement authority and other matters in connection therewith. Item number four, resolution 19R131, a resolution, by the way, if you are wondering why I don't need my glasses on this one, it's because they put it in real big print so I can read it. Resolution 19R131, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing the City Manager to enter an interlocal agreement for wholesale treatment of wastewater services between the City of Shirts and the Cibolo Creek Municipal Authority, or CCMA, regarding the North Cliff Wastewater Plant currently operated by Guadalupe River Authority, GBRA, and other matters in connection therewith. Item number five, Resolution 19R132, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing additional expenditures with Ford Engineering Incorporated in a total project amount not to exceed $71,822.30. 30 cents for design, bid, and construction phase engineering services for the FM 1103 water and wastewater line relocation project in advance of the FM 1103 road widening project. Item number six, resolution 19R133, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing additional expenditures with Ford Engineering Incorporated in a total project amount not to exceed $147,724 for design, bid, and construction phase engineering services for the East Live Oak Pump Additions Project and other matters in connection therewith. Item number seven, resolution 19R137, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing the nomination of Mr. Daryl John for Guadalupe County Appraisal District Board of Directors. Board of Directors and other matters in connection therewith. Item number eight, resolution 19R138, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing the nomination of Mr. J. Keith Huey for the Bear County Appraisal District Board of Directors and other matters in connection therewith. Item number nine, 19 R, resolution 19R139, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing the nomination of Mr. Dan Kruger for 
Comal County Appraisal District Board of Directors and other matters in connection therewith. Item number 10, resolution 19R110, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing the city manager to extend the contracts with Maldonado Nursery and Landscaping and Ace Company for three one-year extensions totaling no more than $131,500 per year for a total not to exceed $394,500 to provide landscape maintenance for medians, parkways, and public grounds and other matters in connection therewith. Item number 11, uh, resolution 19 R 104 resolution by the council city council authorizing a sixth amendment to the interlocal agreement with the Alamo area council of governments or ACOG to provide funding of $42,666 for transit services in the city of shirts. Item number 12 resolution 19 R 135 a resolution by the city council of city of shirts, Texas authorizing the purchase of equipment for audiovisual upgrades for the shirts civic center in an amount not to exceed $235,000. $150 with Summit Integration Systems. And item number 13, resolution 19R127, a resolution by the City Council of City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing EMS debt revenue adjustments, utility billing debt revenue adjustments, and Shirts Magazine debt revenue adjustments for certain and active outstanding receivables and other matters in connection therewith. Any of these that need to be pulled and considered individually? Dr. Scagliola? 4-11-13. Eleven. Thirteen. Any others? All right. If not, I'm going to move from the chair that we approve on consent items one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and twelve. Second. A motion from the chair and a second from Councilman Gutierrez. Any other comments, questions from council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes, no nays. The motion carries. We'll take up item number four. Dr. Scagliola. Yeah, item number four is about the interlocal agreement with uh, CCMA. Now, uh, CCMA, they've been a real good partner with us. And uh, initially when this was brought forward, <coughs> the 3.6 million impact fees, yeah, that was a bit of a shocker. But uh, I've, I've spoken to some individuals and found out the, uh, those particular costs are justified. So I really don't have a problem except with the disposition of the treatment plant itself. I didn't see that any mention of that in the interlocal agreement. So Dr. Brown, the question I have is, uh, who will take ownership of the facility once the, water, the wastewater has been diverted? Uh, good evening, my name is Jim Hooks from Public Works. Uh, the, the property and the plant belongs to GBRA. Uh, they will take ownership of it um, and then We'll see what happens with it. Uh, they'll probably dismantle the plant. Okay. Uh, uh, so this has nothing to do with, with the, uh, the resolution itself. However, I'm in disagreement with actually who owns the plant. But that's a separate issue. Uh, I'll, I'll bring that up some other time. Um, in, in the interim, uh, make a motion to approve resolution number 19R131. Second. Just, just if I could, can I just add a, a comment? Um, so, so GBRA owns the plant, so it's going to be up to them, right, to um, take the proper steps to dismantle and um, deactivate that plant. So we'll be working with them on that. I have a motion from uh, Dr. Scagliola, a second from Mr. Davis. Other comments, questions regarding this one? If not, I'm going to call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes, no nays. The motion carries. Next item we have then is item number 11, resolution 19R104, Dr. Scagliola. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I, I was looking through this in, in the, uh, the package, and um, you know, $42,000 for, for the uh, trans, transit uh, services within the city, and that, that's because it, it's, um, that, that's our half, essentially. Uh, we, um, the Alamo uh, Area Council of Governments get, gets uh, subsidi subsidies, so we pay half for this. I don't really have a question on this. I think it's money well spent. The thing is, there isn't a whole lot of publicity about this, this program that's out there. I don't see a whole lot of, of anything, and they do provide a, a very valuable uh, service to the church residents, so I would very much like to uh, see some more advertising to uh, let people know exactly what is available as far as transportation within within our city limits. Mr. Um, James, I apologize. I, I, I don't. 
I didn't need a, a uh, explanation. I, okay. I just wanted to make that comment. Okay, and we'll run this back through TSAC as well. We've started doing that, so we'll kind of walk them through the program, get some suggestions. Yeah, we can look at how we publicize. The new thing this year is that fixed route that they've started doing once a week, which is kind of one of those steps we had talked about. So, yeah, I think a lot of this is just getting the word out. Very good. Anyone else? So, um, Mayor, make a motion to uh, approve resolution number 19R104. Second. Motion from Dr. Scagliola, a second from Mr. Davis. Other comments, questions from council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes, no nays. The motion carries. Item number 13 is resolution 19R127. Dr. Scagliola? Yeah, this is like the third rail that uh, you never want to touch. So I'm going to touch it now. Let me just say I fully support our EMS, the personnel, the job they do, phenomenal. I have absolutely no desire to abandon the benefits they provide for our city, not at all. Um, but since I've been sitting in this chair, probably biannually, we do about a half million dollars worth of write-offs for the EM EMS. Now, I know it's not loss of revenue because this is money we could never even hope to uh, get reimbursed for. So it's, it's kind of uh, terminology. The key is, though, I think the question should be asked, especially as our cities grow, you know, the, why, why is it that Schertz is tasked with carrying the load for almost half of Guadalupe County, a good chunk of Bear County, and a good portion of Comel County? I am all for a regional approach to our EMS, and uh, you know what? Sometimes somebody's got to be the first to suggest it, so I'm doing just that. That's all I have, sir. I've got a question for you. We, we provide EMS service to other uh, political subdivisions, and they pay us for that, and that helps us to reduce the overall cost for all of our residents. I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm not following your, your concern about the expenditures. You know, um, if it was a, a, truthfully a, a break-even proposition, then uh, I'd, I'd be more than willing to, uh, to have shirts shoulder the responsibility. But when all this considered, you know, you're talking uh, how much does it cost, how much is coming in versus how much is going out. To the best of my knowledge, it isn't a break-even proposition. The city, the residents of shirts still end up paying a small portion of the total cost. Yeah, so uh, we've had a presentation in the past, I think what you'll find is that if we cut off the uh, services that we provide to the other municipalities, uh, stop collecting those fees, that our cost will actually go up. Uh, and we should expect to spend more taxpayer dollars than we are today. So uh, any comment either from Mr. Mabbitt or from uh, our finance director on that one? Say uh, the retained earnings and fund balance for the EMS department are positive, and uh, this year we're projected to be at a highest cash and investment uh, amount that we've we've ever had and there have been some years when they have net of cash and that'd be uh, small short-term loans from other funds to cover that uh, negative balance but this year they've uh, paid all that back and have positive cash um, for a, number, a couple of years in a row now so right and Jason again maybe you can remind everyone of the uh, uh, the Medicare issue that we have and it, there there is no way we're going to get around having write-offs given the structure that the federal government has given to Medicare programs yeah that's correct so for every dollar we charge uh, so 40 cents of it we cannot collect uh, by federal law uh, 30 cents of its bad debt uh, just people that won't pay the bill and so we collect 30 cents on the dollar that's what's left so and that's normal EMS business that's standard. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Edwards? Jason, I think what Mr. Skaglio is, is alluding to is, hey, we've been, I've been on the council 10 years, and I can tell you we've done this. You're right. Every six months is something that we've done. Even when Dudley was standing here, we were doing it, right? So with, with that being the case, I think what he's saying is maybe we need to think outside of the box and see if there's a better way of doing it. I mean, have we exhausted all measures, or, or do you think that we are right on par here? Well, one thing we are doing for next year is the charity care policy that you guys approved last council. So we're actually hoping to remove some of this bad debt and move it over to charity care. Okay. And, and if someone has an accident on 35, 
um, typically, if, if they're traveling through this area, we, if we can't do anything about collecting that debt, but we have to provide that emergency service. That's absolutely correct. Thank you. Mr. Gutierrez. Hi, Jason. Oh, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, I noticed on the other report, I think uh, of all the expenditures compared to everything that we received, I think the difference was, what, $8,000? Somewhere around there? The difference between what was collected and what it takes to fund EMS. Uh, for their over-under? Yes. I think this year is about, we budgeted 8000 above that, and next year we had $313 positive. Mm -hmm. So overall, EMS is doing a great job. We're just not collecting a portion of it, but for everything you do, only being down $8,000, I think you guys are doing a great job. Keep it up. Yeah, and, and like James said, you know, we have a, a fund balance of over $600,000 is what we're going to be ending this fiscal year with. I'm going to move from the chair that we approve resolution 19R127. Second. Motion from the chair, second from Mr. Edwards. Other com uh, comments, questions from council? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 All right, very good. I have seven ayes, no nays. The motion carries. I'm going to um, move to items number 15 and 16 if council has no objection. And then I will come back to 14 and then move to items 17 and 18, I believe. Actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go 15, 16, and then I'm going to move to the public hearing of item number 19. So item number 15 is resolution 19R129, consideration or action approving resolution 19R129, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Sheriff's Texas authorizing and approving a revised election contract with the Guadalupe County Elections Administrator for the conduct of our November 5th, 2009 general election and for the purpose of electing council members for place one, place two, and four mayor for a three-year term and a special election for the purpose of electing a council member for place four for the remaining year of the unexpired term and other matters in connection therewith. Mrs. Dennis. Good evening, Council. My name is Brenda Dennis. I'm the City Secretary for Shirts. Tonight, we have two resolutions before you. Uh, the first one is a resolution revising the contract with Guadalupe County, uh, re uh, removing the Cobbmill County portion. Tonight, I would like to introduce to you Ms. Lisa Hayes, Guadalupe County Election Administrator, who is here with me. So I don't know if you all have ever met her. I'm going to ask her to please come up. Uh, we have become very best friends uh, <laughs> through this process. Uh, she is here. Uh, we have been, you know, um, what we have is to taking the Carmel County portion out. If you have any questions as to why we had to, um, I can have Lisa and then I'll have the other ladies come up as well. But uh, that's what we're doing with Resolution 19R129, and this is Lisa Hayes. If you have any questions. Would you like to say anything just off the cuff that you'd like to share with us? I mean, you're, you're, you're a Guadalupe County official. You do a great job for us. You're welcome to our microphone. Oh, thank you. Well, I appreciate you having me out here, and it's always nice to come out and meet all of the faces that I read about or I see on the ballot. <laughs> so this is always a great opportunity. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions you have about why the contract has to be revised, if you have any. If not, then I'm just happy that you had me here. Very good. Council, questions? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve resolution 19R129. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Edwards, a second from Mr. Davis. I will say this. Listen, we, we have, um, I, I've been running for public office in shirts for now over 14 years, and we have never had challenges with Guadalupe County and with the work that you all do, and that's exceptional. It's exceptionally hard to do. Uh, we, we had some uh, challenges in the past elsewhere. Uh, we have not had those same challenges with the work that you all do, and you do a great job, and we really do appreciate it, especially at, at times when, when you're in difficult circumstances, when turnout is much higher than expected, and you guys have always found a way to accommodate every voter, uh, and I'm, I really appreciate that very much. So thank you. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. I'm going to go ahead and call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes and no nays, the motion carries. Next up is item number 16, resolution 19R130, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing and approving an election contract with the Comal County Clerk, Bobby Kep, for the con conduct of our November 5th, 2019 general election for the purpose of electing council members for place one, place two, and for mayor for a three-year term, and a special election for the purpose of electing a council member for place four for the remaining year of the unexpired term and other matters in connection therewith. Mrs. Dennis. 
Good evening, Council. Again, I have two very special guests that I've uh, uh, really become friends with because this is our f second time in my career to do a contract with uh, Carmel County. I'd like to first introduce the Carmel County Clerk, Bobby Kept, and, um, the, and if she'll come forward. And then I have uh, Ms. Cynthia uh, Jayquay, who is the election coordinator and the deputy to the county clerk. Uh, these ladies and I have become really close, and we won't talk about the other stories because we're not going to have those. But these, okay. these ladies are here. <laughs> these ladies are here because um, I want y'all to meet them and know them. I, I've worked closely with them, and I think things are going to be great. Fantastic. Anything you'd like to share with us, please feel free. All I have to say is I am impressed with the way you read the agenda. <laughs> It's years of practice, man. Years, years of time and grade, as the military says. No, we're very excited to work with everyone. Very good. Council, any questions for the folks that are here from Comal County? If not, is there a motion to approve Resolution 19R130? So move. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Edwards, a second from Dr. Scaglioli. And the comments, questions from Council. Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 I have seven ayes, no nays. The motion carries. Thank you all Thank very you. much. Tell Judge Krause I said hello. I did. I did want to do one other thing, and she's still here. Where'd she go? She may have gone, but i um, been working with the uh, Public Affairs Office, and I'm quite impressed with the work that has come out. I'm going to pass you one of these. We're going to have these available. Um, we're all going to vote centers, and uh, this is great information, great work from the Public Affairs Office, great work. I want you all to see this. Please. I want to thank Devin and I want to take thank um Sarah Gonzalez, this is a great piece that's going to help our voters learn and uh, where to go on uh, early voting days and all the wonderful vote senders that on election day. This stuff is just in English, but the uh, official posting will be in Spanish. But this is great work. I want to thank them very much for their hard work. Absolutely. You want to expound on this just a little bit, This uh, what these voting centers are and with the advantage to the individual voter and why that's important? Well, the vote centers, you know, used to a long time ago, you know, you look on your car and you got this precinct and you got to go, where do I vote? Okay. So on election day in Guadalupe County, you're going to see there is, I believe, uh, let's see, 34 places on election day. Um, uh, Guadalupe County voters can go to any one of those on election day. Uh, in uh, Carmel County, there's 13. You can go to any one. If you're a Carmel County voter, now remember, you've got to be it's in the county. But what's really impressive this year, there is 284 vote senders for Bear County. So if you work wherever you work, instead of having to come way over here, there's 284 locations that you can vote at. This is great stuff. This is great stuff. So um, people that work close to one of these centers can go vote. Great advantage. It's, I think it's going to help out a lot. It is. And, and some of you may remember, uh, it wasn't so many years ago, that if you lived in Comal County, you would go and you'd vote in Comal County for everything that was in Comal. And when you wanted to vote in the city election, well, you'd have to come over here at downtown and shirts to vote in the city election. You have to go to multiple places. Uh, that was a bit of a hardship on a voter. Uh, the fact that voters don't have to do that anymore uh, is, is, is not just a, a nicety. Uh, it is empowering folks to do the things they need to do because you may only get an hour from your employer. And it's tough to go to two voting places if you only have an hour and get back to work on time. Uh, this makes it where everybody has a chance to cast every vote that they're eligible to cast. And that's good for uh, uh, not only for our community and for our elections, but good for our republic. 
Excellent work. I appreciate it. The counties have worked very hard to do this, and you thank them for doing this. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Mayor and Council. Good stuff. All right, I'm going to move on to item number 19, which is a public hearing. This is Ordinance 19S25, and it says, An ordinance by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, to approve a specific use permit to allow for operation of a convenience store with gas pumps on approximately 8.5 acres of, of land, more specifically described as the northwest corner of the intersection between Interstate Highway 35 and Schwab Road, City of Shirts, Como County, Texas. So we'll have a staff presentation, then we'll have a public hearing, and after the public hearing, we'll open it up to the City Council. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Nick Copier, Department of Planning and Community Development. Uh, and like Mayor Carpenter said, this is a specific use permit to allow a convenience store with gas pumps. So just for your reference, this is the property here outlined in green. Uh, it's at the northwest corner of I-35, this road here, and Schwab Road. Um, the road behind the property here is Ball Lane. In preparation for this hearing, four public hearing notices were mailed to surrounding property owners and a notice was published in the San Antonio Express. So far, we see one response in favor of this specific use permit. Um, here's the current zoning map of the area, the location of the subject property is indicated with the gold star, and as you can see, the property is currently zoned general business. So looking at the effects of this specific use permit on the surrounding properties, uh, to the west of the subject property, again, indicated with the gold star, is the remainder of the 16 total acre site uh, that is undeveloped and currently zoned general business district. Uh, to the south, uh, this property is adjacent to the I-35 right-of-way. Uh, to the east, the property is adjacent to Schwab Road and undeveloped land zone general business. And to the north of the property is undeveloped, uh, excuse me, and to the north of the property is uh, adjacent to Ball Lane uh, and manufacturing light zone property that is developed with Cisco, uh, the National Food Service uh, distributor. Um, since the potential convenience source gas pumps will be immediately adjacent to three roadways, uh, land that is zoned general business and manufacturing light, this means that the approval of this specific use permit would not have an additional adverse effect on the immediately surrounding properties. According to the comprehensive plan shown here through the future land use map, a uh, subject property is designated as highway commercial, which is this dark red. Uh, you'll see uh, the proposed convenience store with gas pumps is a retail commercial use that can take advantage of the highway frontage, uh, which is compatible with the proposed land use mix for the highway commercial uh, land use designation in the comp plan. Uh, quickly, we'll run through the conceptual site plan. As you can see here, they're proposing a 7,300 square foot convenience store. Um, and then a total of 17 gas pumps um, under two different canopies. One is up here, and then the other one is down in front of the store here. Uh, access to the site is going to be proposed through uh, five new driveways, uh, two right-in, right-out driveways on the I-35 frontage road uh, here and here, one full movement driveway uh, on Ball Lane here, uh, one full movement driveway on Schwab Road down here, and then one right-in, right-out up here on Schwab Road as well. Uh, these access points, along with a comprehensive traffic impact analysis study, have been approved by the City of Shirts Engineering Department and the Texas Department of Transportation. Uh, they're also proposing to add 62 total parking spaces, size 10 by 20, uh, and 12 truck parking spaces, size 14 by 55, uh, up here. Uh, the site meets all of the landscaping requirements in UDC Article 9. They're uh, proposing to plant 94 total trees, including 36 live oak, 34 Texas ash, and 24 Texas road, uh, redbud. Uh, the proposed elevations also meet all of the architectural requirements that are now in uh, Article 9 of the UDC. And overall, the site plan meets all the requirements outlined in the Shirts UDC. And therefore, staff recommends approval of specific use permit to allow a convenient source gas pumps conditioned upon the following. A building permit is approved within one year of the adoption of the SEP ordinance, and the use begins operation within two years of the issuance of the necessary building permits. Uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission met on September 11th uh, and offered a recommendation or approval by unanimous vote. Um, the applicant is also here. Uh, I would like to make a short presentation if you want to hear that uh, after this or during the public hearing. I'd like to, uh, I guess if there's a presentation, do that prior to the public hearing. So if the public wishes to comment on it, they'll have that opportunity. Sounds good. Mayor and Council, thank you for your time this evening. Uh, my name is J.D. Dudley. I'm the real estate project manager for Quick Trip Corporation. Um, I know the last time I was up here, I did give you the whole production, so I'm not going to do that again today. Uh, really, I just wanted to show you uh, just a couple of the slides that weren't in staff's presentation. So we have
had a couple renderings done on this one just to show you what it would look like. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to point this out is we are proposing an entryway feature, um, something that we came up with in the design phase and very conceptual first stages of the process. Um, it is, we understand, one of the gateways of the city and so we wanted to do something nice for the city. Uh, this isn't ultimately how it needs to look. This is what we're proposing. So if there is something different that staff would like to work on with us, uh, we'd be more than willing to do that. But this is what Quick Trip and uh, our design team came up with. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to point out is the infrastructure that's coming along with our development. Uh, and Nick touched on that in his presentations that we are actually extending Schwab Road the entire length of our frontage to a six lane almost divided thoroughfare uh, with medians, turn lanes, uh, and all the improvements necessary to make that road functional. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have at this time. So we'll actually uh, uh, go to public hearing first, give the public an opportunity to speak first, and then uh, we'll open it up for council. And if council has questions either for staff or for you, we'll. Uh, do that at that time. Thank you, sir. All right, so at this time, I'm uh, going to open the uh, public hearing in just a minute. I uh, would ask anybody who would like to address the council, come forward and do so if you would give your name and your address uh, so the city secretary may capture that for the minutes. Uh, we ask that you keep commentary to around three minutes. Uh, if you need a little bit more time, I've got a little leeway as the chair and can grant a little extra time, but uh, around three minutes is the target. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing. And anybody who would like to come forward and address the council regarding this matter may do so at this time. Appears I may have no takers. Everyone sure? In that case, I'm going to close the public hearing, open it up to council. Council, questions? Mr. Edwards. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we approve Ordinance 19-S25. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Edwards, a second from Mr. Davis. Council, other comments, questions? Dr. Scagliola? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I, I uh, joked to somebody one time that uh, 1103 was someday going to be just as busy as uh, Schertz Parkway. Well, okay, that, that, that was an easy one. And then I went on, on to say that, you know what, I bet you someday Schwab Road is going to be in contention also. Um, this facility, though, will actually lessen the congestion on that particular intersection. Looks beautiful, Re really does. Uh, I hope we have enough uh, water around to keep those lawns green. That's the only thing. That's all I have, sir. Anyone else? If not, I do have a motion and a second. I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 I have seven ayes and no nays. The motion carries. All right, that's 19S25. That is an ordinance, so that's first reading. That will come back before us again uh, at our next meeting. All right, I'm going to move back to item number 14. Item number 14 is uh, discussion of potential refunding opportunity of outstanding SAWS contract revenue bonds uh, with regard to the shirt Seguin Local Government Corporation to achieve debt service saving on the bonds and therefore annual savings uh, to SAWS. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is James Walters. I'm with the Finance Department. I have with me tonight Andrew Friedman from uh, SAMCO, who represents Shirts and the SSLGC in their bond uh, issuances and refinancing. Uh, tonight he has an item he wants to present to you for future uh, action, uh, no action required tonight, on a potential refunding uh, for SSLGC that the Shirts uh, City Council will have to sign off on and how it benefits its partner over at SAWS. Thank you very much. Andrew Friedman with Samco Capital Markets. Uh, this is just a short uh, refunding presentation for SSLGC for contract revenue bonds that were issued and are secured by revenues from SAWS. So unfortunately, I'm not here to present good uh, refunding news for the city since the beneficiary of this will be SAWS. Uh, but you can see behind page two, uh, those 2012 bonds uh, are refundable. They've got coupons between 3 and 4 percent. That table on the, right, on the left side shows the annual debt service, what's already outstanding, and the proposed refunding debt service based on the lower interest rate environment that will generate just over $2 million in savings uh, based on interest rates as they are today. Uh, that's a very conservative estimate. So those, those savings we hope to be much greater. Uh, and then you can see that uh, roughly 7.43 percent 
savings over the refunded uh, bonds. The benchmark we typically look at for a current refunding is 3% or better. So this is a very, very good refunding uh, for, uh, and, and for the city and for SSLGC to act as a good neighbor, so to speak, with SAWS. Uh, behind that is a timetable uh, of how this proceeds for those of you who are new to the Shirts Again Local Government Corporation. Uh, they are the issuer of the debt, uh, so they're taking action. Uh, and you can see on this third page, on October 17th, the cities of Schertz and Seguin each have to ratify any action taken by uh, the corporation. And so the parameter sale will be passed by SSLGC on October 17th. It'll be back before you all on October 22nd uh, for your approval. It'll go to the Seguin City Council for their approval, uh, at which time uh, we can proceed to a pricing which is tentatively scheduled for November 20th. Uh, and we'll be executing that deal at that time so long as uh, we meet at least a 3% savings threshold. Uh, my guess if interest rates hold, will be somewhere closer to 10% by the time we get to pricing. Uh, and then again, SAWS is the beneficiary. We're not saving any money. Uh, I did think I would take the opportunity to tell you that our next refunding opportunity for the city uh, will be one year from now. We have bonds that will be callable at the beginning of 2021, which means we'll be able to move forward on that refunding at the end of 2020. So uh, if interest rates hold uh, for us, we'll be able to make that uh, refunding happen a year from now. But there's obviously no telling uh, where the markets will move in the meantime. I'm happy to answer any questions that you all have, uh, go into more detail about the more of the inner workings of the SSLGC, if that would be helpful. Uh, but I turn it over to you all for questions. Council, any questions on this one? Mr. Edwards. I just have a couple of questions real quick. Um, are you guys reviewing all the bonds for the city as well? I know you said we have one opportunity coming up in 2021. Yes, we're, we've looked at all of them. And, and this one coming up in 2020 uh, is going to be our last bite at the apple. Frankly, all of our bonds that were issued after that have interest rates ranging from 2 to 3%. Uh, for the most part, and that's just going to be difficult to save for, to refund for any savings. I just, I but we're always an keeping an eye on it. Yeah, I think that's an opportunity we need to make sure we capture. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Scagliola? Yeah, I was teaching a class on uh, present value and future value of money the, the other day. It's a, it's a little uh, uh, challenging there. Uh, these, these bonds uh, issued in, in uh, 2012, uh, so they're only seven years old. Um, and they're being being called now. When when they are uh, a refund, when when they re redo the bonds, is is that going to be for another twenty years, or or is it? We'll be matching the term of the existing bonds. So as you look at page two, uh, that was attached, the table on the left side, you can see the the fiscal year end there on the far left. Yeah, that next that. column, prior debt service, is the debt service on those two thousand twelve bonds. If SSLGC and SAWS do nothing. Okay. We're simply uh, matching lower interest rates uh, against the existing maturity schedule. Oh, okay. That annualized savings. All right, gotcha. So we're not extending the maturity schedule or, or changing really any of the structure beyond uh, mm -hmm. similar how, you, I guess not similar to how you would refinance a mortgage because you could refinance a mortgage out uh, right. to a longer term if you so chose, but that's not the intention here. That's excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Or anyone else? I personally don't have any objection to SAW's ratepayers seeing a savings. Looks like we're good. Let's march forward. Thank you. Very good. Thank you all. I'm going to move to item number 18 at this time. I was resolution 19R134, resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing and approving professional services agreements with Ford Engineering Incorporated, Half Associates Incorporated, Kimley Horn and Associates Incorporated, and Utility Engineering Group, PLLC, for on-call engineering services and all matters in connection therewith. Good evening, Ms. Woodley, how are you this evening? I'm good, Kathy Woodley, engineering. Um, so five years ago, we hired four on-call engineering firms. They've served us very well. Um, that was Ford Engineering, um, Cobb Fenley, LAN, and Cape Dawson. Uh, we had a three-year contract. We extended that twice for one year each. Um, and so it was time to go out again to um, request qualifications for uh, the next three to five years. We got 26 responses, which is really tremendous. I think, you know, folks really want to be working here in shirts. Um, it was a very difficult decision. The quality of the responses were, were very good. 
Um, and we um, are recommending that we hire Ford, Kimley Horn, half and Associates and Utility Engineering Group. Um, they have the, the skills and the qualifications to handle just about any project that we um, have a need for engineering services for. These firms will be used for contracts that engineering does, as well as public works. Parks uses them. Um, some of the on-call services were used for the fire station. So, so really, citywide, this contract is available for use. Very good. Questions? Does that include the uh, Kimley Horn? Yes. Anyone else? The Kim Kimley Horn is a great firm, and so is Ford. So. And we need to keep the economic development engine moving, as well as all the infrastructure work that we need to do maintenance on moving. So I'm going to make a motion from the chair that we approve resolution 19R134. Second. second. Oh. A motion from the chair, a second from Mr. Davis. Other comments, questions for council? Hearing none, I'm going to call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes, no nays. The motion carries. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to go back to item number 17 at this time which is Ordinance 19-T-26. Consideration or action approving an ordinance by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing an adjustment to the fiscal year 2018-2019 budget to transfer personnel budgets between departments, repealing all ordinance or parts of ordinances in conflict with this ordinance, and declaring an emergency and providing an effective date. Again, we are declaring an emergency on this one, so we will have a single hearing of this ordinance. Mr. Walters. Deputy Mayor and Council, uh, I am James Walters from the Finance Department. When we go out about doing our budgeting, um, we're unable to necessarily pinpoint which department will have turnover, especially if they have a low amount of staff. So one of the te techniques we use uh, to get a more accurate budget is to do a flat uh, turnover adjustment for all departments. Some departments that are bigger, it has more regular turnover, it's easier to give them a more accurate turnover on top of the, the general. Um, but some other smaller departments, we just do a flat amount. Uh, but what that means is, get a little closer overall on the budgeting for turnover, uh, but then certain departments that don't have turnover or have other situations that come up that use more overtime uh, will have to be adjusted at the end of the year, usually from departments that actually receive that turnover. Uh, so that's what this adjustment is, is taking um, uh, personnel from, from departments that had that extra turnover and moving that to departments with no turnover um, or some other special circumstances. Uh, does not change the overall budget allocation that was approved for last year. And one of the reasons we're doing this in a one reading, uh, we've had our final payroll. These should be solid numbers for the year. Um, and consulting with our, our legal services, uh, we cannot adjust the budget after the fiscal year end. So this is the only chance we would have to adjust it and get those departments back in balance. Very good. Council, questions? If not, is there a motion to approve Ordinance 19S25 as an emergency measure? So moved. Second. I have a motion from Mr. Brown, a second from Mr. Larson. Other comments, questions for council? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Edwards. I, I, you said the ordinance number was 19S25. Am I, am I reading something wrong? Oh, maybe I went to uh, item number 19 instead of going back to, uh, I see I've, I've, I've fooled myself by moving all around the agenda. And, uh, it's ordinance 19T26 on, as an emergency measure. So, you want to? Did we get a second on that already? I don't know if we got a motion. We didn't get a motion because we didn't get that motion. Right. So, 19 T26. So moved. A motion from Mr. Brown. A second. Second from Mr. Edwards. Comments, questions for council? Mr. Mayor, can we expand on what the emergencies are? Uh, yeah, we've reached our last uh, payroll period and coming to the close of the fiscal year. Just so the public will know. You bet. All right. Anything else from council? If not, I'll call for a vote. Aye. 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 Seven ayes, no nays. The motion carries. Thank you, sir. Next item we have on the agenda is a roll call vote confirmation. Mrs. Dennis. The, the first is consent one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and twelve. Motion made from the chair, seconded by Gutierrez. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Brown voted yes. Council members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Edwards, Gagliola, and Hayward voted yes. Motion passed. Second was item number four, resolution 19R131. Motion made by Council member Scagliola, seconded by Council member Davis. 
Mayor Pro Tem Brown voted yes. Council Members Davis Gutierrez Larson, Edward Scagliola, and Hayward voted yes. Motion passed. Next was item number 11, Resolution 19R104. Council Member Scagliola made the motion, seconded by Council Member Davis. Mayor Pro Tem Brown voted yes. Council Members Davis Gutierrez Larson, Edward Scagliola, and Hayward voted yes. Motion passed. Next, next is item. Number 13, 19R127, motion made from the chair, seconded by Council Member Edwards. Mayor Pro Tem Brown voted yes. Council Members Davis Gutierrez, Larson, Edwards, Scagliola, and Hayward voted yes. Motion passed. Next is item number 15, resolution number 19R129. Council Member Edwards made the motion, seconded by Council Member Davis. Mayor Pro Tem Brown voted yes. Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Edwards, Scagliola, and Hayward voted yes. Motion passed. Next is item number 16. Council Member Edwards made the motion, seconded by Council Member Scagliola. Mayor Pro Tem Brown voted yes. Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Edwards, Scagliola, and Hayward voted yes. Motion passed. And last, item number 19, Ordinance 19S. 25 first reading council member edwards made the motion seconded by council member davis uh, mayor pro tem brown voted yes council member davis gutierrez larson edwards scagliola and hayward voted yes motion passed uh, item number 18 resolution 19 r 134 motion made from the chair seconded by council member davis uh, mayor pro tem brown voted yes council members davis gutierrez larson edwards scagliola and hayward voted yes motion passed and finally Item number 17, Ordinance 19, T26, first and final reading. Motion made by Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Member Edwards. Mayor Pro Tem Brown voted yes. Council Members Davis, Gutierrez, Larson, Edwards, Scagliola, and Hayward voted yes. Motion passed. Thank you. All right. Next up, requests and announcements. Uh, announcements by the City Manager. Anything further this evening, Dr. Brown? Uh, next request by the mayor and council members, items be placed on a future council agenda. Anything that we need to have that we don't currently have scheduled? Dr. Scagliola? Yeah, we got an email recently about the need for an easement uh, related to the North, North Cliff golf, golf Course. So my request is that when the city contacts the owners um, with, with the easement request, my request is that we also ask for a PLC so that we know uh, who is in charge uh, for other matters of concern. That's all I have, sir. So that's just a request of staff. That's not an agenda item. Mr. Edwards. My, my, mine would be a request from staff, too. I don't know if you guys have all received all the emails, um, but it was coming from the Ashley Oaks Park that we just did recently, Ashley Place. And um, a lot of people are asking questions about the rope structure. I'm assuming there are a lot of injuries that have taken place. So if we can address that, I mean, it's a playground, but they're saying maybe um, a different type of structure, but if we could just at least have someone talk, reach out to those people. Dr. Brown, do you have anything you'd like to say about either one of those? Uh, did you want that on the agenda? No. Okay. Neither is an agenda item, just a request from, uh, from the council. Well, we, right. we have been talking to um, we have been talking to the residents about Ashley Park uh, as well. So I'll follow up on that. Um, on the easement, um, I don't know, uh, Mr. Santee, if you want us to comment on it, but um, I don't think we're going back to the owners at all. Yeah, we, if, if if this needs to be discussed, we should put it on a future agenda. If I want to talk about the easement. Okay. I think the request was just from Dr. Scagliola for consideration of his point. I'll coordinate with Dr. Brown so that we don't need to put it on the, the agenda. Okay. If that's uh, acceptable. All right. Anyone else? Mr. Larson. Well, I, you know, we heard uh, some hearing of residents today, and I've, I've kind of been following this water meter issue as well. Um, generally, I, I, I get in trouble here. Generally, I dismiss. Uh, overly aggressive chatter on social media, but it has been, a, I've seen a pretty steady stream, and so I'd like to learn a little bit more about that and even maybe have a workshop where we can have an update of what the city's done to, to look into that, and um, I know, uh, I, I've been hearing what a lot of the responses residents are getting, and so I, I think I have 
some level of confidence of what's what's happening, but I have also seen the news reports of other places. So anyway, it's just a, maybe an update on, on um, are we actually getting a lot of complaints of that nature? How many complaints of that nature are we getting? How many? How is it? How are this billing different today than it was prior to the meter change? And if if we have anything to be concerned about or not? Great. How, when can you when have the, the next meeting, or do you need a second meeting from now? What would be easier? I mean, our next meeting is not until uh, actually October twenty second. What do you think, James? Okay, October twenty second. October twenty second, the next meeting. That'd be great. I appreciate it. Anyone else? All right, if not, I'm going to move on. Next item, we have our announcements by the mayor and council members, and we'll start with Mayor Pro Tem Brown. Nothing to know, sir. Mr. Davis, Mr. Gutierrez. Yeah, a couple of things. I attended uh, Pizza with the Police. Uh, it was a great gathering. I uh, appreciate our, our police department being out there. And also the fire department had something on, uh, you know, meet the uh, firefighters at the Starbucks. It's great to see our community, our our staff being out there, uh, being involved, involved with our residents. Also attended the uh, NEP luncheon and the chamber luncheon. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Larson. No. Mr. Edwards. Mr. Mayor, yes, I also attended the um, Pizza with the PD. I thought it was a great event. Um, came through on a whirlwind tour, but I also um, went to Starbucks and had a cup of coffee, and, and I also just kind of drove around shirts to say hi to everyone. Very good. Dr. Scagliola? Nothing tonight, sir. Mrs. Hayward. Uh, yes, Mayor. I attended uh, Pizza with the Police. It was a great turnout. It was nice to see that a lot of the kids were interacting with the uh, police and uh, just seeing them out there. And thanks to Matangas for hosting it. It was, uh, it was awesome. I attended, got to see our friends over in Selma at the Chamber Ribbon Cutting at the iMart in Selma. Uh, it was a nice turnout as well. And I did go to the NEP luncheon. And that is all. Very good. Thank you. I've been invited on Sunday to join a group on Fort Sam Houston. I guess we call it JBSA, Fort Sam Houston now, or I, I'm just going to call it Fort Sam because I've been here long enough. There's a luncheon being held for the uh, Gold Star Mothers. And um, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, that's, that's for the, the moms and the family members who have lost a child uh, in the service of their country. Uh, I personally can't imagine what that's like trading in the blue star for a gold one. Um, but what I would ask is that while you're going through your weekend, um, think about and remember all of those that have given their lives in the service of our country and in the preservation of this republic, and in particular, on Sunday, all of the mothers and families who live with an empty spot at the table um, throughout their year. With that said, if there's nothing else from the council or from staff, and we stand adjourned.